Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. So as you can tell from the title of this video, we're going to be talking about the Vengeful Spirit. But we're going to be talking about a certain event that happened on the Vengeful Spirit. It's probably one of the biggest things that happened during the Siege of Terror. And that is the Void Shield of the Vengeful Spirit being shut off so the Emperor, Rogaldorn, Sanguinius and their retinue could board and fight Horus in that epic showdown. But of course, there's always been some mystery about who actually turned them off so that's what we're going to go into today look at some of the theories speculations and of course go down that glorious rabbit hole so let's jump in and let's get started I want to give a big shout out to a chap called Hysterical Hyena over on the 40k law reddit. If it weren't for his little theory, he probably wouldn't have inspired this video because I do have my theory, but his theory is also really cool. And we'll get to that in, in like the later stages of the video. For right now, I just want to explore some of the, the most common, well-known, and just go over some of the most basic stories on why the Void Shields were shut off on the Vengeful Spirit. Now, the most common story about this, and it's mostly accepted in the actual lore itself, is that Horus himself turned off the shield to the Vengeful Spirit. He wanted the Emperor to come aboard. He wanted to fight him. He wanted to smite him, kill him, do all that mean stuff that Horus intended to do. Because Lehman Rus, Rebuta, Gilliman, the Dark Angels and stuff, all their fleets were starting to enter the Soul System. And he thought, right, this is my last gambit. I need to entice the Emperor aboard my ship to finish this battle right here and and right now. And from a logical standpoint, that does make the most sense because if the fleets of Rebute, Lehman Rust, the Dark Angels, and whatever else was following them into the Soul System, the only big way to try and demoralize them and just to get a, a sense of victory is to kill the Emperor. So, you know, I, I can see Horus flipping that switch and saying, right, it's time for the rumble above terror. Let's get it on. Now, if we go down the rabbit hole and we start to look at other characters who could have turned off the shields and brought the devastation that happened upon the Vengeful Spirit, one of the main ones that stand out for me is a chap called Horus Axman. His, his nickname is called Little Horus. He has that because he basically is like a little version of Horus. He, he looked just like him. Now, he is a big character when it comes to the Lunar Wolves, aka uh, the Sons of Horus, because he was part of the Mournival. He was part of the Mournival with um, Abaddon, Tarek Targaryen, and Garvey Loken. He was, you know, them four were like BFFs, you know, advising Horus on what to do in certain situations, battles and stuff, basically being Horus's right-hand man, or men, should we say. Now, of course, when Horus decided to betray the Emperor, um, members of the Monovil split. You had Abaddon, who was basically for Horus. Yes, let's burn it, kill it, you know, purge it. I'm following you, Father. You had Tarek Tor Garadon and Garavio Loken, who was against it. And then you had little Horus Aximand, who was basically in the middle. He loved his brothers. He loved Tarek Tor Garadon. He loved Abaddon. He loved Garavio Loken. He was very reluctant to join Horus in the Heresy. But of course, in the end, he chose Horus because the love for his father outweighed everything else. His love for his legion and the brothers a part of who was, you know, still following Horus. That were his choices. That's why he followed Horus down the road of damnation. Now, little Horus actually fought one of the Monoville brothers and actually killed him, and that was Tarek Targaryen. Like I said before, he, this this these these people were very, very close to each other. So that for me is like the inkling of regret when it comes to little Horus and his actions on that day. And maybe that they will have an echoing effect when it comes to the Siege of Terror. Now, I have been reading the Siege of Terror series, and the characteristics of Little Horus has changed somewhat. He does seem a bit more brutal than he was during the first couple of books, so I'm wondering if the authors have kind of changed his personality over the past couple of, well, I'd say past couple of years, over the years and years since the Horus Heresy has been going. But what I loved about this character is that his, his, his regret, well, not, not sorry, not really his regret, is that his remorse for killing uh, Tarek Targaryen and the actions that they had to take to get them um, where they were today. So I always thought that it'd be a really, really cool thing that little Horus was the one to flip the switch in one moment of redemption. Just that one last moment to say to himself, yes, what we did was wrong. Maybe this will forgive me. This will maybe clear me of my sins and maybe the Emperor will come through as victorious and we all deserve to burn 
in the fires of our treachery. But again, the more I read about Little Horace, the more I read about the siege and his interactions within the siege, the less I am convinced of this theory now, just because he's just so much of a brutal badass, to be completely fair. Like, he fought Sigismund, he was all in for that. Um, I'm sure he's going to be fighting more known characters and stuff like that. Maybe he will get his comeuppance in the in the actual siege itself, and he will die actually on the ground war, because we, we know for a fact that there's not really much written about him after the Siege of Terror, so maybe this is where little Horace Axeman dies fighting for Horace, and he actually does burn in the fires of his treachery upon terror. Now, the next candidate for turning off the shields and bringing devastation is, of course, none other than Garvio Loken. We all know the history of Garvio Loken. He fought in Istvan. He survived Istvan. I think it was only him and Ancient um, and Rylanor who, who were the ones who actually survived the virus bombing. I don't want to really go into Ancient Rylanor's story. A bit of a spoiler there, but he goes out in a blaze of fire and glory, if you've read it. Um, but, of course, little... Um, I'm sorry, not little Horace. Garvio Loken um, actually does have uh, of course, a lot of history with Horus. He was Horus's right hand man. You know, he was part of the Mournival. He knows Abaddon. He fought Abaddon. He technically lost to Abaddon um, on Istvan, and um, he wants his vengeance. He wants his vengeance for his fallen legion. He wants his vengeance for the Imperium. He wants his vengeance for the Emperor and all his brothers that he lost for Horus's treachery. Now, we know in his current situation, he is being used as an agent of Malkador. Yes, he is not a Grey Knight as of yet. I don't think he will become a Grey Knight, personally. I think his destiny lies elsewhere, and I think maybe he could be the one to actually venture on the Vengeful Spirit, and actually turn off that switch it does make sense because of course Loken knows the Vengeful Spirit he knows his way around the decks yes it's probably twisted and a kind of um, um, a cruel and awful place that it used to be but he knows where to go he, he knows um, you know probably passages and secret areas and stuff because he was part of the Mournival and stuff like that he probably knows that ship like the back of his hand so if he was to be able to infiltrate that ship which the um, uh, the, the agents of Malkador do have some secrecy and you know some weapons and stuff and of course Malkador with his psychicness maybe could like conceal him as he gets on board or some you know bizarre thing like that if he gets on i'm sure he could find his way and turn off that switch maybe if he's even on the ship he could start fighting some of the known characters aka little horace or something like that maybe not abaddon or anything because of course abaddon is probably going to be on the ground wall fighting and smashing things but some known characters that we know in um, the sons of horace that he can come across get his vengeance and then maybe in his last dying act because maybe it causes his death or something he switches that switch and that allows the emperor to jump on board purge Sanguinius's death, Rogodor to fight the broken body, but it's the death of Horus. He is the one that causes Horus's downfall. I think there's a lot of poetic justice in that, since Loken was the one to first receive the blunt of the War Master's treacherer, himself and all his brothers down on this van, they were all wiped out, bar from Loken, as I've stated before, so it'd be kind of cool for us to see him come back and flip that switch off, and in his dying moment, or in his last moment, or whatever bloody moment you want to call it, that it was him it was the last son who survived the treachery of isvan surviving this quick all the way and damning horus and his legions to defeat at the hands of the emperor of mankind now moving on to the theory of hysterical hyena because this is a really big eye opener and you know what i can't believe i didn't see it before especially so reading all the siege of terror books and he thinks that maybe it's abaddon that flips the switch and turns off the shields to bring death upon the emperor or force the final battle between the emperor and horus and it actually does make a lot of sense because for those of you who have read uh, the siege of terror series so far it actually does state that the way that horus is um he's acting and behaving at this moment in time like he's in like a comatose type of state because he's fighting the emperor on a different plane of course you know like the psychic like power kind of plane you know uh, the powers that may be and every time like he more or less comes around there's there's, there's kind of a little bit of horus missing from that like the chaos powers are so much inside of him like he embraced chaos too much he's not using chaos as a weapon chaos is using him as a weapon and the power that they're putting through him is like bloating him into like this 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 massive just just evil kind well evil is probably the wrong word to use but you know what i mean like um 
the powers are just too much for him and it's just going to rip him apart and eventually kill him. And Abaddon sees this and he's he's like, come on, Horus, let's go down. Let's take the planet. You know, we, we have to do this. We have to fight. Let's lead from the front. Like, you know, the good old days. And Horus is like, no, you know, we have to defeat the Emperor and this time we have to do these certain things or victory is lost. And, you know, Abaddon realizes that chaos is, you know, it, it, it's gripped Horus now. The Horus that he loved is more or less no longer there. And it's just this whole other entity, this whole other beast that's taking control. So since he doesn't see Horus as Horus anymore, you know, he flips that switch. He wants the Emperor to come on board. Maybe he wants the Emperor to actually kill Horus because it's not Horus anymore. It's Chaos. And he's sick of the Chaos Gods using the person that he loved the most as their pawn, as their weapon. Maybe he wants the Emperor and Horus to completely wipe each other out in just with the mass amounts of power they have, so it gives them um, a kind of a clean slate for the Legions to start dominating instead of, you know, the Emperor and Primarchs and all that kind of stuff. Horus has seen what Chaos really is, but Abaddon has also seen what Chaos really is. You know, Abaddon, he's there at the forefront. He's, he's the first captain of the Sons of Horus. He's probably, you know, second in command, uh, bar probably certain Primarchs and stuff, but he's seen what the powers do to people, like um, his interactions with a, a character called Lyak and stuff like that. He he hates Chaos. He's seen what Chaos has done to, uh, you know, the demonic Primarchs and stuff like that and how 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 Chaos enslaves them. So maybe, you know, it's, it's his last defiance or maybe his last act of remorse to his father to flip that switch and want Chaos to be completely obliterated from the figure that he loved the most. Again, I think it'd be a really cool twist if something like that happened. You know, Horace's most favoured son was the one that more or less brought his damnation upon him, his death upon him, let's say, in more or less like an, well, I'm going to say like an act of kindness. You know, he wanted to save Horace, and this was kind of the only way to save him. He actually makes a, 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 a pretty good point, um, um, hysterical hyena, that where was Abaddon? when the vengeful spirit was being assaulted. You know, there's no mention of him at all. Um, the, the only thing I can ever think of is when Aaron Demsky Bode mentioned um, when Sigismund, when, when, when um, Abaddon and Sigismund fought and Sigismund was said, I always look for you on the battlefield and always lesser men were in my way. So maybe, you know, he was actually on the ground war, Abaddon, um, when all this happened and maybe he, you know, he teleported back up, flicked the switch and just hid in a cupboard and then, you know, whatever happened, happened and then he took command of the vengeful spirit, got it out of there and whatever happened, happened from then on and, you know, the story where we are now, this is this this is where we are. All right, Chapter Neils, that is me done for another video. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching as always and um, please leave your thoughts and feedback on there. Is there any more theories on who could potentially have turned it off? Do you think it could have been someone else that we've not been thinking of? Do you think it was actually just Horace himself saying, screw it, flick the switch, bring it on, Emperor? Or do you think it's someone like Abaddon, uh, Garvey or Loken, or little Horace Axeman? Please post it below. We can have a nice little chat down there, as always. Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. See you now, and bye-bye.